In this video, we'll talk about a few more applications of the accumulation equation to modeling with systems and special equations. So our first other example here beyond multiple tanks is the idea of multiple springs. This is not going to be a first order equation because springs, when we talked about them by themselves, were modeled by second order equations. But the same ideas can apply to a situation where you have multiple springs and multiple things interacting at the same time. The idea for one spring that we had back in second order equations was basically that if I had a mass on a spring, I basically looked at all the forces that were acting on that mass as it was in motion and accumulated which way they were pointing and then used all that to put together what the equation should be for the acceleration because mass times the acceleration, which was y double prime, would equal the sum of all forces on the system. And we had things like the spring constant force that was a minus k times y and the drag force was a minus gamma times y prime. Now when we have multiple springs going on, it was just going to be that now there are more forces interacting to see what's going on with this problem. For example, if I just have one mass that is attached between two springs, two different walls like this, there's some point where it will sit in the middle. And just like for the first issue, when we had second order equations for a single mass on a spring, the key point you want to start from is the equilibrium value, where the mass would sit at rest with no interaction to it. So we have our zero point that sits in here. And the idea is if I were to push or pull this mass one way or the other and let it go, it would oscillate back and forth. And the way it would do so depends on both of the spring constants here any damping in the system or any sort of friction that's involved and the mass of the object. The basic sort of complication here beyond the first version for a simple single mass on a spring, it's still a single mass, so it's not a system of equations yet, but the idea that we're going to sort of build from is something like this. If I pull the mass this way, and so now the mass sits over here somewhere, spring K1 wants to push it in that direction because it's, it's compressed the spring too far. But spring K2 also wants to pull it because it's now extended too far. And so both of them are pulling in the same direction. So it really ends up like you're sort of adding the spring constant together when you work this out. And just by a force balance, you could see that if I let Y be this position, I would have that M Y double prime should equal, well, any drag that's there. We'll sort of ignore that at this point. And then there's two different springs acting on it. There's K1 that acts like normal because it is going to pull when spring extended too far times Y. Assuming Y goes positive this way like it would for the K1 spring. But what happens to the K2 spring? Well, the K2 spring is going to push back, but it's pushing back relative to negative Y because negative Y is how far K2 is extended. If you put all that together, you get something like m y double prime plus gamma y prime plus k1 plus k2 y equals zero. So a system like this effectively adds the spring constants together. This worked out nicely for one mass, but you can do the same thing if you have multiple masses interacting here. And we have this now for an example. I want to set up a system of second order equations or a physical situation with three springs in a chain. I have the first spring that's attached to a wall and is attached to a mass, another spring, a mass, another spring, and a wall over here. The total distance in all these three springs is fixed, but I can move either mass and sort of see how they all wiggle back and forth once I do that. So the problem says that this first spring has a constant 5 newtons per meter. The mass here is 2 kilograms. The second spring is 1 newton per meter. Second mass is three kilograms. And then we have a seven newtons per meter on this side attaching it to the wall. So how do we set up this system? Well, first let's mark out the zero points for each of these masses this is where they would sit at rest with no adjustment and no perturbing. And then we'll let X1 be how far that is pulled that way. And X2, how far this mass is also pulled to the right. So now I want to write a system for this in terms of how it's going to behave based on x1 and x2. So I have two equations here for the net force or the accumulation of acceleration in these two objects. 
So for the first one, I have twice x1 double prime. That is my sort of maximum acceleration term for the first object. Now we're assuming there's no damping, so there's no x prime terms. We only have the position terms. Now what forces apply to this first mass? Well, there's two. There's a force from this first spring here, and there's a force in the middle spring. Now the first spring is fixed on the wall and extended by an amount that is x1. So it will pull the mass back with a force of negative five newtons per meter times x1. I'm gonna change x2's color here so we can see what that looks like. Now the second force that acts on it is from the middle spring here, this one newton per meter spring. Now how much does that pull or push on two. Well, it's going to push on the two kilogram mass out based on however much the total distance that it would want to be extended is compressed. And how much this is compressed is going to be x1 minus x2 because if I want to squish the middle spring, I have to push the first mass to the right and the second mass into the left to squish that spring. If I shift both of them to the right and equal amount, I have not stretched or compressed this middle spring at all. So it's not gonna give me any force if the difference between x1 and x2 is the same as it would normally be at zero because that spring will not have been extended. Now let's think about sines real quick. If I look at x1 minus x2, x1 minus x2 is a compression of this middle spring because x1 has moved farther to the right than x2 has, are compressed, which means it's going to want to push the two kilogram mass back to the left to equalize things out, which is the same direction that the five newton spring is going to pull this mass. So I will get here a negative one newton per meter. You can also visualize this way. If I were to just push the just the three kilogram mass off to the right, it would try to pull the two kilogram mass with it which means that if I make x2 positive, then x1 should try to get bigger and increase. And I will get that because I will end up with a positive second derivative here. If I make x2 positive, this is negative, this is positive now, it's gonna pull in the positive direction. We can do a similar thing for the three kilogram mass. And for that, I will get something like three x2 double prime equaling, now for the end spring here, the seven newton per meter spring, the setup is still the same. Even though this actually is pointing in the wrong direction, it's still going to be a negative 7 newtons per meter times x2. Why is that? Well, if x2 is positive, this spring wants to make it negative. It wants to make it go back to zero. The acceleration is always opposed to the position. Whether that be positive or negative, it just means that now x2 being positive is a compression, not an extension, but it works out the same way. And then we have the middle term again for this middle spring has a one newtons per meter on it. It's related to the compression here. So x1 minus x2, give me the compression in the spring. But in this case, the compression of this spring wants to make x2 be positive because that will lessen the compression. So I will get a plus sign in here instead of a minus sign. So this now gives me a setup for a second order system that would model how this mass on spring setup would behave. We haven't looked at how to solve these things, and that's entirely fine. But the point is you could set this up by looking at the different setup, which way the forces go and how they all interact to build a model for this kind of situation. Another way this modeling gets used in a way that has sort of become near and dear to everyone's hearts over the last, you know, 18 months is with disease modeling, particularly with the SIR model. Something you will see in your last MATLAB assignment. But the basic idea is to take a population and you can divide it into three groups. You have the group of people who are S, or susceptible to the disease. You have I, those who are infectious or infected, depending on how you want to view the model. And R, people who are removed from the population. Usually this means that they have recovered. This can also mean people who are removed in the sense that they have passed away from the disease, or other causes. So how do people move between these groups? Well, it's possible for someone to become infectious from being susceptible if they interact with a person who is infectious. So this happens at a rate of some constant times s times i, 
central person interacts with an infectious person, there's a chance the disease spreads, and that's modeled by a term like this. You can also move from I over to R at some rate beta times I when you recover from a disease or pass away from it. So this gives us an easy way to write a system of equations that model this setup. So for instance, ds dt, s only changes at a rate of negative alpha si, i changes at in alpha si minus out beta i, and r changes just at plus beta i. Now this is the simplest version here of what this might look like. The assumptions here are basically that a person is susceptible, they can get the disease at most once, once they get it they recover and they can never get it again. That's the general idea of what this system says here. You can add more complicated things, right? Maybe there's a chance that someone who had caught these before can become susceptible again. And that would result in a line that goes from R back into S and add a couple more terms to the equation. And you can use this to do a lot of different disease modeling type things by adding different parameters, different sort of setups to what, what this can do. And people have actually used this to model things like the COVID-19 pandemic under certain circumstances. They make certain assumptions, they set up the model, they run the equation, see what happens. You can get some nice results out of that just using this setup. And it's a lot more complicated than this. You can do a lot with this for sure, but just seeing how this might set up and how this might work is a good thing to keep in mind as a potential application of modeling with systems. And you'll see a lot of these in the MATLAB assignment. I'd recommend still taking a look at it even if you don't have to do it, just to get the handle on what you can do with this and what can come out of these sorts of models. I think it's really cool um, what you can visualize for the data and stuff with this, and I'd recommend taking a look at it. So there's a couple more applications that you can use to model with systems, how you might set them up using the accumulation equation, and what you can do with that once you put them together in this way.